I just want to say a few things to introduce you to this course. Um, the first thing obviously would be the uh, elementary elements in respect to how you approach it in writing the papers. You've got two kinds of papers to write. Uh, a brief a paper of 500 words and then a secondary paper of um, a thousand words and you can see in the syllabus what I require you in that. The main thing you have to do is to make sure that you present a bibliography in the thousand word paper uh, particularly and then at the end of the course you have a longer word paper of uh, 1500 words and what you have to do there is again present a bibliography and present um, uh, one or two uh, external sources to uh, buttress your paper and uh, as you'll see in the syllabus to use Turabian in respect to it and follow the guidelines that I give in the announcements in terms of how to write a good paper I'll follow that because it's very important, um, a writing a formal paper and not just uh, something that you're writing in a casual sense, as you'll see. Uh, that's all I'll say about how to write the papers. Um, as an introduction to the course, it's a, a marriage, um, in a way, between what I'd call a, a theological approach and then something of a, uh, a sociological, anthropological, uh, political approach to look at it. As you can see from the standpoint of the um, title itself, Introduction to Community Development, which is uh, rather vague in one sense, but it's uh, also uh, purposely vague because it's expansive in another. It deals with the, uh, what you might call them, the uh, uh, micro and the macro level of community development. It's expansive enough to include the international level and the national level and the local level. And you'll see that with how I've actually um, put the course together. So that I begin on the local level and then I branch out in the weeks that follow on the uh, national level. And finally, I broaden it right out into the international level and then that leads into the uh, final paper from that standpoint as I try and tie it together. Uh, when I talk about the uh, uh, local and national level, I use examples from my own experience, which has primarily been on the uh, local level, although I've had some experience, a very brief experience on the uh, international level, where I worked for two years in Swaziland in um, what is called Iswati now, not Swaziland, in uh, Southeast Africa, where I was teaching at a university there, teaching uh, uh, students for education who would be teaching in the school system in Iswati, uh, where I was teaching uh, New Testament. And I had the opportunity to do my own, uh, what you might call, uh, very, very limited, because as I say, I was only there for two years. Uh, one day, some, a student came to me and actually wanted to um, he wanted to cut my lawn and he came with a machete that was shaped like a golf club and I looked at it and I thought how are you going to cut my lawn in respect to that uh, at the time this is in 1998 so uh, unemployment was about 55% so I wanted to help him but I thought that will take ages to do that so I had an idea I went out and I bought him a uh, weed eater uh, that uh, a weed whacker, I think it's called here, that would cost me about 120 rand. That's not very much, uh, about $25. And I gave it to him and I said, this is much better. You just have to put uh, gas, petrol, as it's called there, in on it, and you can cut this grass very quickly. So here's what I would like you to do. I bought this for you and you can pay me back at 10 rand a month. I think it was 10 or 15, I asked him. And then when you've paid that off, then what I suggest that you do is that uh, I can use it then to employ it and buy these things for other people and you can expand your business. And he did that. He paid me off and gave me the money back and I was about to use it for other people and he got to a point where he started to employ other people. And so he started a sort of a, a micro business there and uh, I realized what I could do. But by that stage I was in a point where I, I was running out of money myself for the school system that I was putting my children through with my wife, and so we had to come back to the States. So I was actually making $750 um, a month in Switzerland, in 
Esiswati, uh, as I was teaching at the, the university there, which I, I really couldn't survive after two years. But that was my experience, which is not very much of an experience, but, uh, but I've done lots of things on the local level, as you'll see, um, uh, with the homeless population um, in Chico in different ways, and I bring that up in the weeks that lie ahead, as you'll see. So that's the structure of the course, and at the same time, the structure is uh, dependent on the way that I've approached the course, and I'm just basically doing giving you an introduction. I mean, when you look at the wording of this course, the uh, development of uh, what? Uh, developing a community. Uh, what on earth does that mean? It's very, very vague. What does developing mean? Uh, usually Christians don't talk about that, and, and we are approaching this from a Christian standpoint, which is interesting in itself as a perspective, because Christians don't talk about developing a church or developing a community. Usually it's much stronger language that's used that in respecting to a verb. It will be um, growing a church. Uh, developing is, is sort of, uh, well, it's, it's sort of a, a rather abstract. It's not necessarily mission-minded. It's more um, uh, static or organic. It's, uh, 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 is it going somewhere? When you talk about developing, it's uh, ongoing, um, developing from what to what and so forth. What's its origin and what's its purpose? Whereas the idea of a church, when you look at it, especially with the uh, what you might call the mission statement, so to speak, or its uh, uh, strategic planning and its goals of where it's going, you see it in the book of Acts, or right in the middle of the New Testament. So by, by middle, I mean it's connecting the Gospels with the letters. You definitely see something more than a development that's there uh, in terms of a mission-minded Jesus, the way that the canon's put together, where you end with Jesus saying, go into all the nations and develop a community. That doesn't seem quite right, does it? In other words, it's a very modern term that's used for us today to understand uh, the whole idea of uh, what we're about. Because we're beginning from a Christian perspective. And then the whole word uh, community. Um, that's a, a very modern, in, I would call it a post-enlightenment um, notion or a modernistic or postmodern notion, the idea of community, um, as opposed to koinonia or a church setting, which has its own uh, rubric and its own um, uh, nuances that uh, have uh, ideas of a very strong notion of um, a momentum, uh, an eschatology of last things, of where it's going, what it's about. Whereas community has still has some notion of, of being st static, uh, or else it's a marriage between uh, church and society. But when by society, what do I mean? Uh, I don't necessarily mean church, which is those who are uh, saved and brought to Christ, transformed by Christ, whereas society is a mixture of people who are transformed by Christ and people who are not transformed by Christ who are living within society, a society that once was wholly transformed by Christ or else was in at least its structure, its organization, what we would call its civic structure was orchestrated theologically. I'm thinking of the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church in the Middle Ages, as we call it, right through the Reformation until uh, the Enlightenment times from 1750 onwards within the movement uh, towards what uh, we call now secularism, where the church has become something of a, an appendage, where it's not really needed to function. What we need to function is a government, a secular government. And so that uh, your example, the example that comes to my mind as I think about it, is uh, William Kuyper, who was a Calvinist, uh, who became prime minister of the Netherlands in um, 1903. And he, as a, a devout Christian, as a Calvinist, then worked on the basis that he was um, overseeing the churches that were in the Netherlands, but he was also overseeing the unbelievers because he was the prime minister of the Netherlands. So he had to operate on the basis of um, ruling over both. So he operated on what he called spheres. The spheres were... Uh, if I can put it in an illustration, 
um, when you come out from church, you um, hug your brothers and sisters. You don't necessarily do that now with the COVID crisis. Perhaps you bump fists and wear a mask. But in pre-COVID times, you would uh, hug one another or shake hands. Whereas if you come out of um, Save Mart or Rayleigh's after you've got your groceries, then you don't do that if you meet someone. You might shake hands or just say hello. In other words, then, the job of someone who is a Christian, who is functioning society in two ways, in terms of how he operates as a Christian and how he operates as a secular governor, as we would call it today, are quite different. And so developing a community then has a sort of a, a double life for us because we're talking in one sense as a church person and then we're talking also as a person who is concerned about issues that arise in society that we have to deal with. Now, our first mandate is the building and the growth of the church. Or, if we don't accept that, we could look at it in a different way and say, it's faithfulness to Christ. And being faithful to Christ leads to the establishment of the church. And we explore that to some degree early on because we have to have a theological foundation in what we're doing before we look at the national and international level of how we are to function in developing a community. And in doing that, then, we ask the question of what is, what is politics? Did Jesus have a politic? Did he believe in a kingdom? Was the kingdom of this world? Was it a spiritual kingdom that had nothing to do with the political structures of this world? And so we can happily put ourselves in our churches and pray and preach the gospel and either have nothing to do with the structures of the world of what's going on in places like Rwanda and Peru and the Philippines with uh, prostitution or uh, human trafficking or uh, a debilitation that's going on in prisons. And the only way that we can rectify those situations is to contact those people who are involved in that and bring the gospel, which is transformation in Christ, to them? Or is it that we can do that, but we do it in a different way? That we recognize that our goal, because we're really talking about life from the church perspective, is to bring them to Christ, but a way to do that is to address their concerns or to put it in a crass sense of what's talked about today, is to address felt needs. And felt needs are to address human trafficking, the way that health of babies or job creation in Uganda and Kenya and so forth, establishing a rich uh, water supply um, in South Africa or dealing with gun violence in um, Johannesburg and uh, places in uh, Indonesia where there are, there are no wells to provide sufficient uh, water where disease is rampant and so forth. Do, how do we approach that as a church perspective? Or do we approach it from the standpoint of using the conduit of secular um, organizations that we align ourselves with through the United Nations or through secular organizations that are purposely built to function like that or we create them ourselves and from that standpoint we become um, uh, experts or we try out ways to create endeavors, enterprises that help people to become self-sufficient or solve their problems for from us in the West who've had all the advantages from the establishment of the sort of new world from the uh, 14th century with the Prince Henry the Navigator and Portugal and, and Christopher Columbus and so on going around the hall crossing to the Americas and the expanse of what you might call white Europeanism and colonialism and so forth that uh, went on. We're to the point now where we, we're trying to 
bring what's called the, the third world, the developing world, the point where they, they can uh, get the resources that we've got and we're helping them to do that. And we do it through the church and then the conduit is to do what? Is to help them to find these things and then is our job done or is that a way that we help them to find Christ or is it in today's world that we let the church be the church and as the church is the church then the church's job is to preach Christ but we as Christians who have found Christ we recognize that we have interests and talents as we go to university, to different schools, to different organizations. And as we become involved in these organizations, we go into the world and we do these things with these enterprises to create job creation and so forth. And there we mix with people and we do it under the auspices that are quite different. We do it under the auspices of uh, what's called natural rights or human rights. So that human rights in terms of providing better facilities and better conditions for uh, prisoners in uh, uh, Peru or Belgium or whatever the situation, as well as in our own country, then this is the way that we operate and this is the way that we um, um, understand what a moral law is. We can base that, say, off our own declaration of um, independence. We see it in a way that uh, satisfies us as Christians. Now, we're going to find that the danger is that we, we're living in a, in a, uh, a world that's saturated with secu uh, through secularism to the point where frequently people don't want to know the spiritual side of what we do, but are very satisfied because they have to find some moral basis to uh, uh, talk about sex trafficking and the moral basis of of providing water for people who don't have good clean drinking facilities and job creation and so on and they do this through without god through through more the moral law is what i what i would call it and we would agree with that but as you'll see from people like stanley hawass and john yoda and others in that tradition is the danger is when the church starts dealing with that from that perspective and that's a political perspective too is that frequently the church loses out the church loses out because it gets it, it gets sort of swallowed up eaten up by the secular perspective and the organizations that once started as theological organizations that were helping people nationally and internationally they they lose that perspective and become purely secular. Good examples would be, uh, well, I just read that Harvard University has just appointed a, a, a chief chaplain to organize all the other chaplains at the university, and the chief chaplain is an atheist. He doesn't believe in God. How did that come about? You've got the disparity right at this moment of Joe Biden, who's a devout Catholic, as he's portrayed, who believes that abortion is not right, that it's a sin, but at the moment, with what's going on in Texas, where Texas has, uh, the lawmakers just passed a law that, that it's uh, a, an offense to have an abortion after, I think it's six weeks, where a heartbeat, or what they call a so-called heartbeat that has opposed this law, is detected where you can be prosecuted and Joe Biden is saying that's unconstitutional and, and I want to protect the rights of every woman in other words what you might call that those are human rights so Biden's got to deal with the element of his personal faith which he thinks is it's wrong but also natural rights that he's advocating because he's the president of the United States you see the tension that's there we've got to deal with this tension in some way or other in the sense of the, the purest notion, if I can use that word, in which the church is the church, and, and the, the other notion of, of, of how far the church can be the church and advocate for all these things that are good in respect to helping people in the, in the US, in the third world, 
I'm involved with that. I'm involved with that right now in Chico. This may come out right now of where I am today. I mean that literally today because there's an injunction that a, a, a judge in Sacramento had just put out just recently that's stopping the Chico City Council from driving out what I call the, the Dalits, the untouchables of Chico, the chronically mentally ill, the chronically homeless, the Chico City Council wants to just drive them out and, and get rid of all the encampments, stop them from being in town. They can't camp anywhere, so they're just driven out. And the judge in Sacramento has said, no, you can't do that as an injunction that's there because you haven't provided a place for them to be. So I, along with uh, two or three others, are actually feeding people the untouchables in the plaza right now because the city council can't move them on. The police can't move them on. So there's tents in the city, in the plaza because there's no way at this point that the city council can actually determine that public space means that the homeless people must not be able to camp there and call that a place where this is where they stay. They're, they're, they're going to be pushed out. But at this point, because of this injunction, they can't do that. And we're standing up against that. That's, that's, that's just one of the things that I'm enjoying, I'm part of at the moment. And, and hopefully this course will finish and will give you a sort of vista in which you can go forward yourself and marry your, what I'd call your, your your testimony or your witness to Jesus in such a way that you can go either locally or internationally into the world and do what God lays on your heart to do in respect to developing a community. Thank you.